Yep. We're ready to move to our next session and then there'll be a short break. So I'd like to welcome Stephen Hug. Stephen's going to demonstrate 8-Bit Workshop, a web-based IDE for 8-Bit Programming. Thanks, Steve. Hello. Am I coming through? All right. Yep. Everybody. Good. I'm going to share my desktop real quick. Go to my slide thing. Um, ah. My name is Steve Hug. I run a website called 8-Bit Workshop. Um, what is 8-Bit Workshop? It's an interactive development environment for 8-Bit platforms. It runs on your web browser. And it started out because I wanted to learn how to program the Atari 2600 in assembly language. And of course, the obvious thing to do is write an entire website to help me do that. Um, so let's show you the website real quick before we go too far. This is 8bitworkshop.com. Get my cursor back. Um, as you can see, the left side has your assembly language. The right side has uh, the emulator, which is called the uh, Javatari. It's a very nice emulator from, from Fellow. Um, and then what you can do is just edit the code on the left side. Let's see if I'm going to change that constant, make the screen yellow. It assembles, it puts your ROM into the emulator and restarts it uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And the nice thing about Atari programming is most people uh, keep their, all their code in one file, so you can just upload, paste code in, and it runs almost immediately. So I have a bunch of examples that come in with the IDE, like uh, demonstrating sprites, and you can see all the code is right there. Um, small games, uh, you can use a joystick, uh, I think you can even use paddles, but that's the Atari. And since then, it has grown into uh, assembler and also C programming for Z80 platforms, 6502 platforms, and hardware design, which is a whole other topic we won't discuss today, but you can write code in Verilog and simulate hardware designs in your browser. Uh, at, if you're designed simple enough at a real time speed, so you can actually play a game in it. And also, now it supports uh, more than a dozen platforms like Commodore 64, various Atari consoles, um, and of course, the Apple II, which is what I'm going to talk about today is the Apple II support. Um, our Apple II emulator is a, a generic Apple II Plus with 48K of RAM plus a language card. You can write a similar code. You can write C code. Um, you can, it uses a, a free ROM, which, which has no AppleSoft basics, so you can't write AppleSoft. You can, write, uh, you can write code that is loaded directly into your, the code just gets injected into RAM and executed directly. And there's no hard drive, there's no disk drive uh, yet, but I plan to add that in the future. So let's, uh, let's go into the Apple to take a look at that support once I get my cursor back. There we go. Computers, I select here from the platform, select Apple II. And the first thing I'll see is the first demo program, which is a benchmark that came with the uh, the, the CC65C compiler, an open source compiler used for a lot of platforms. Um, it's just a prime number generator, so that's pretty simple. You can edit the C, so I can you know make a mistake, and then it'll correct the it'll correct my typing, show me the error. And once it compiles correctly, it'll just uh, recompile again and start it over. And there's a bunch of different examples here, just kind of a grab bag. Uh, we can do Mandelbrot fractals. We can do uh, good old Eliza chatbot, you know, or all of our problems. Um, simple, some simple games like a blockade-based text game, written in C also, and uh, some high-res stuff. It'll do high-res graphics. Um, this is the thing we'll, we'll be dealing with today. And what my goal is to put this on to a real Apple II. Well, first, let me show you one more thing, the debug tools, which are on the left side. So uh, we can disassemble the code. I can reset. I can step through all the assembly code that's generated by the C compiler. It will show me all the symbols that the C compiler generated. I can browse memory, so while the thing is running, I can see memory uh, move in real time. I can see an overview of all the Apple II RAM. I can drill down into specific sections like uh, the high-res graphics. Um, I can see the graphics change. And also, I can see a, um, I, I can see a, a visualization of graphic of, a, of a, all the RAM, all the graphic of memory space. And if I pause it, I can, I can see uh, this is the graphics area up here. So I can see the graphics being written to. And I, if I pause it, I can put the cursor over and see like the exact commands that were used. 
and where the program counter was, which could be useful for debugging. Um, I can see a step-by-step uh, or cycle by cycle overview of what's going on with the CPU. All the reads, all the writes, all the what have yous. And since we have symbols from the compiler, I can see all the reads and writes that took place on all the symbols and <laughs> all the all the executions, all the all the all the functions that we're executing and how many times they're executing. So I can kind of get an overview of what's going on with my my program as well as a call stack where I have you know all the C functions are assembly functions that were called, and how many, how many times they were called. And uh, that's also helpful for, helpful for debugging. There's also a simple bitmap editor, so I can just go in and uh, you know, do simple, some simple things with uh, the graphics, and it'll reload my program, restart it. So those are handy tools, but that's the main thing I want to talk about is this nifty thing I found from DataJerk called C2T. Some of you may have come across the Apple II disk server, Apple II game server. Um, this is an easy way to get software on your Apple II without any hardware. You just need to plug in your uh, headphone jack, hopefully you still have a headphone jack, into the back of your Apple II. And uh, I've integrated that with the IDE so you can just export your programs directly to a tape file and then play them through your headphone jack into your Apple. So let me, uh, let me show a quick video of how that works that I made previously because I don't have my Apple II with me right now. Let's make sure that sound is off on this thing. So there's my Chromebook running the Apple, II, the Apple Workshop IDE. There's the back of my Apple. I'm plugging the headphone jack into the Chromebook. I'm uh, using the Make Set Audio menu item in Apple Workshop to generate the file. Then I'll boot my Apple. Hit reset to go into AppleSoft and uh, type load. Load will uh, look for a signal which, which will hopefully contain an AppleSoft program. And because of the C2T tool, uh, will expand into a machine, pro a machine language program, which will then load a compressed data stream from the cassette tape file. After about 30 seconds or so, uh, it'll decompress the file. And then my program right from my web browser is running on my Hello Kitty TV. And everything's great. So that's just a nifty little trick I added just for the Apple, the Apple II. Um, I wonder if Data Jerk is here today. Maybe we can talk and I'll tell them how great the uh, program is. So how does Apple Workshop work? Well, I pulled in a bunch of emulators, emulators from all over the place, uh, some open source projects. Uh, for the Atari 2600 and the NES. I compiled some things from C to WebAssembly, like this uh, chips library, a very, uh, very small Commodore 64 ZX Spectrum library. And a lot of these were so simple, I just wrote them in JavaScript and TypeScript. Uh, a lot of the arcade games, uh, you know, pretty simple architecture. And uh, they just run in JavaScript. I also pulled in MAME for some things. MAME is Name is uh, runs fine. It doesn't have any debugging support, which is a drawback. Uh, I don't have that in there yet. And the, the other things you, you need are the tool chain. You need a compiler, assembler, and a linker. Those all run in your browser. They're compiled from usually C to WebAssembly, and they run in a web worker in the background. So they're kind of just always running whenever you edit, and you don't notice the. They don't interrupt your editor flow. So it's not perfect. It's not not a great text editor. It's not using the best, probably the most accurate emulator, but. Um, and it has no file system access. So everything's saved in your browser. You can synchronize with GitHub. You can import, uh, export to GitHub. You can push pull. It's got a basic GitHub interface. And for larger projects, uh, there's no custom build steps, so assets and stuff. If you get, if you get into a real complex project, you're going to want to probably you know, write your own build script by that point. But uh, that said, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of full projects in a, that Able Workshop does support, full games. Advantages, of course, nothing to install. It runs in any modern browser, Chrome or Firefox are your two choices nowadays. Uh, it's pretty fast. JavaScript's pretty, pretty speedy these days. It runs on, uh, doesn't take a lot of memory either. It runs on small devices. And it's just great for trying out new ideas, uh, prototyping things, exploring other people's source code. Five minutes, Steve. Five minutes, thank you. Well, right, on, right on schedule. And one more thing I'll do, I'll show you a couple things on Apeit Workshop, like the project gallery. Um, these are just a bunch of open source programs that are compatible with Apeit Workshop. 
that uh, other people have written from various platforms. Uh, one is, there's one Apple II project here, which is a Manic Miner port. Um, it runs right inside the browser. And you click, ooh, that's great music, but it's loud. If you click this button, it'll import it right into Apple Workshop from GitHub, and you can, it'll compile it. You can play the game, edit the game, mess around all you want. And one more tool I want to show you is Dithertron, which is uh, a recent tool. It converts uh, full color images to 8-bit formats. This is also an 8-bit workshop. Um, if, you, if you see the up here, you, have, you, you select an image, upload your cat or your travel photos, whatever from your photo library. Pick a platform. Default is Commodore 64, but we do have an Apple platform here. So if I load my favorite picture and adjust the sliders, it'll kind of dither it the right way. However, I can pick a dithering, dithering pattern that I like. I can mess around till, till I'm happy. And then I can open that in APIT workshop, click this button, it'll load the, it'll create a little file viewer program and uh, you know, I'll see some sort of kind of pointillism, uh, French impressionist thing on the, on the right side that looks almost close to what I want. Uh, and that, uh, and I have that for not just the Apple, but all these different platforms. So you can easily write that uh, graphic adventure you've always been putting off. And so that's the other Tron. That's also an APIT workshop. And uh, so the future of APIT workshop, uh, obviously it'd be nice to add every platform under the sun and every language on the, under the sun. Um, you know, isn't, we've selected a nice, uh, a nice mix of C assembly. I'm, I'm interested in other languages, new languages, old languages like fourth also, maybe some basic uh, I don't know, Pascal. Um, new sample code would be nice. It'd be nice to have full projects that are compatible with Apple Workshop. It's really hard to find, uh, you know, compilable Apple II projects. They're out there. They just take some effort to find and uh, cram into the proper assembler format. Or uh, There's very few C projects out there, obviously, because there's C programming wasn't really a thing uh, for Apple II very much. Um, one other thing I like to experiment on is making peripherals in Verilog. Uh, I can show you that if you haven't seen the Verilog interface, but um, this allows you to write hardware um, in Verilog and it'll simulate it if it's simple enough at real time speed. So this is a, a brick and paddle game written in Verilog. It can be burned into an FPGA. But it'd be nice to write Apple II peripherals in this or any other computer peripheral and integrate that with your emulator. Um, another thing I like to do is more d different debugging tools. Um, there's a nice time travel feature in, in the uh, IDE right now that hasn't been really, uh, I can't find my cursor, but the idea is you can, uh, you can rewind and uh, you know, rewind state, kind of debug at a certain location, just drill into where you want to go. So I'd like to make that uh, a debugging, debugging option. Uh, so also, we have a bunch of books for programming Atari, the Atari 2600, uh, arcade games in Z80, with the Z80 C compiler, designing hardware in the Verilog for video games and making NES games. Those all integrate with the ID and you can follow along with the examples. So you might want to go to Apple Workshop and check it out uh, and follow Apple Workshop on Twitter. And if there are any questions, I'll jump out of here and see what's going on in the chat world. Yeah, we got time. We got a minute here, so maybe one question. Have you considered publishing 8-Bit Workshop as a native application so your emulation doesn't break whenever the browsers upgrade? Oh, psh, psh. Um, well, I've thought about that. Uh, one option is to use, um, uh, make it a native uh, JavaScript with Electron. Electron makes uh, web pages into native applications, and I've uh, thought about doing that. I haven't, uh, haven't really got into it, but that's, that's probably the option we could take. You can have an offline version for Windows, OS X, uh, and uh, Linux. You can also download the whole source and run it on your local web server. It'll run. There's no server required. Um, can you disassemble Apple II ROM images? Uh, you can upload uh, disk files, and it does have a disassembler, so it's not the best reverse engineering tool yet, but it does, uh, it, you know, it can disassemble things. Okay, we're at time. So thanks again, well, Stephen. Well, thank you, guys. Um, and we're up to a 15-minute break, and then we'll return for our last block of talks. See you.